And I just knew that in the long run, I wouldn't be happy staying at my current position. And at some point, I wasn't giving it my all. I didn't feel like that was fair to my bosses there. Hey there, I'm Goli Kalkaran, and this is Lessons from a Quitter, where we believe that it's never too late to start over. No matter how much time or money you've spent getting to where you are, if ultimately you are not happy, then it's time to get out. If you're feeling stuck and you feel like there's got to be more, there's got to be a way to feel fulfilled and excited about what you do, then this is the podcast for you. Each week, I will sit down with an inspiring guest who quit their professional career in order to forge their own path and create a life that they love. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Lessons from a Quitter. I am So happy to have you here, and I really appreciate all of your support. You're in for a really good one. This episode with Kim Lee Pham is amazing because everything she touches apparently turns to gold. We will get into her story, and if you end up liking this episode, do me a favor and share it with a friend. I think that you all have friends who are unhappy in their careers, and it would help me out, and you'd help them out. So go ahead and share this episode or any episode that you love. We'll jump in in a second, but I've been thinking about this thing I wanted to talk about on the podcast, and that's about thinking outside the box. Now, I used to hate when people said that because here's the thing. When you're in a box, you don't know that you're in the box, and it's really difficult to figure out, like, how do you think outside of that? And especially for people that are in traditional careers, we've basically been trained to live in that box. Like you are taught how to think, all of your schooling, all of your, um, even your work experience is following directions, doing what people tell you and living smack dab in the middle of that box. And so to say like, think differently is really difficult. And so I was hoping to give a little bit of background and some concrete examples to show you like how we can start kind of observing our own lives and really questioning things so that we can take steps, uh, you know, towards our happiness. And I'll explain why I think that is so important in order to leave the job that you're at and really figure out what it is that you want to do. So what I've been thinking a lot about, because a lot of the pushback I get when I talk to people about leaving a career that they're unhappy in is so often we just accept that like this is the way things are, right? Like you have to have a job to support yourself and your family and really to have a stable life. And so you can have the mortgage and the white picket fence and, you know, all the other stuff that we're supposed to have. Um, This is the way it is. And jobs are not fun. And, you know, we all work long hours. And that's just the way that life is. And we sort of resign to the fact that, like, this is really the way the world is. But a lot of times it's really interesting to think how short lived, like, this world that we have created has been. Like, this isn't the way the world has always been, right? And in fact, it's usually only like 50, 60, 80 years that we are doing something. And when you look at the, number of years that humans have existed. It's like a blink of an eye, right? And so I think it helps to kind of start looking at all of the things that we've just accepted it as truths and really questioning like, is it really a truth? So like going back to the 40 hour work week, I mean, we all, I think most people may know, but we just accept that this is the way it is yet. We know that like, it hasn't been like this always. And It's only really been like this for like 80 years, right? Before that, before like the 1920s, 1930s, people were working 10-hour days, six days a week, right? And if you go to other countries now, there are still like different work schedules. I've mentioned this before, like my family is from Iran, and in Iran, you only get one weekend day, which totally sucks, but (laughs) that's a topic for a different podcast. Um, But I say that to say like, we don't ever think that other places do things differently. Like we just accept that this is the way it is. And, you know, we started the 48 hour work week for unions and other like reasons. Um, But we have just sort of accepted that like, that's the way it has to be. And now there's a lot of scholarship and there's a lot of research as to why that doesn't serve us. And I think a lot of people realize now why, you know, when the 40 hour work week started, it was more for 
blue collar jobs and it was a lot of manual labor. And so, yeah, if you're building a railroad, it's teamwork and you need everyone to be there at the same time. And it's kind of when there are when it's like light out. But that doesn't work for white collar jobs when you have to use your brain because we literally cannot focus for eight hours. And we all, if you've worked in any office, you know that, that you are not productive the whole day. You are productive for a couple of hours, if that. And the other time you're scrolling the internet or you're chatting with your coworkers because we are physically incapable of sitting down for eight hours and doing really focused work and work that really requires like intense thinking and creativity. And so we're actually really losing out on like what we could produce for our jobs because we are like forced into this box of like, well, everybody comes Monday through Friday, nine to five, and we're going to stick with this. And we're seeing a lot of change in that, obviously, with the change of technology, things are changing very rapidly. And so now we see a lot more remote working, where as like 10 years ago, that wasn't even possible because we didn't have the technological capabilities. But, you know, they're projecting something like 50% of people will be working remotely in in like the next 10 years. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of perks to that. And companies are kind of realizing that like things are changing. And I think that that is just one way of looking at like, it doesn't have to be the way that we think it is. You know, another thing I was recently reading, um, and it just was funny to me, is that like gyms, are something that has have really only been around since like the 80s, right? Like people used to not work out. Like that wasn't a thing. And in fact, in like the 40s, doctors used to advise against exercise and lifting weights. And they would tell their patients the dangers of that. Like if there were people that were, you know, men usually that were boxers or whatnot, they would advise them against it. I think if people are familiar with like marketing campaigns, then we all may remember that like doctors used to come on TV and talk about the brand of cigarettes that they endorse. Like, clearly things change. You know, I mean, I think we all understand this and as an intellectual exercise. We understand that, like, the way things were in the 1950s are not the way that they are now. And yet, for whatever reason, we can't accept the way that things are now also don't have to be this way. And I think the more you can start questioning, the more you can really start just observing why we do things. And that's, this is not just with work, you know? I mean, maybe with parenting. Like, clearly parenting changes every generation. And it would still, like, behoove us to question, like, why am I parenting in this style just because everybody else is doing it? Is this actually, like, benefiting my children? Maybe I want to do it this other way. Or even in relationships, you know, we've all sort of, like, towed the line of, like, what a good marriage should look like. And like, maybe that's not what works for you and your spouse. And I think the more we start to question, like, why have I been doing this? And like, is it okay to try something else? The more you start learning how to think outside of that box, the more you start exercising these critical thinking skills of like, huh, why have I done this? all the time. And if this is making me unhappy, maybe there is another way to do it. And maybe I can question that instead of just like feeling guilty for not wanting to do what everybody else wants to do. There's a wonderful show. I think it might be on Netflix. I'm not sure. That's called Adam Ruins Everything. And in it, the host basically picks a topic that has been like accepted by people. And he gives a history of how that thing came about to be. Because so often we think that we have a rational reason for it. And then you realize that like 99% of things were just some kind of marketing campaign that we were sold to because somebody wants to sell a product. And we just accepted that thing. So anywhere from like mouthwash and toothpaste, like, you know, how we've been sold, like when we should brush our teeth or whatnot. There was a recent episode that I watched where he was talking about the whole American dream of buying a house with a white picket fence came about from a marketing campaign from a housing development company in like the 50s or 40s. And they obviously want to sell houses. And so they sold this dream and this idea. And then it has become like part of the fabric of our country and what everybody strives to. Now, I know there might be other uh, conversations because of like tax benefits and stuff that there might be more financial benefit of owning a home. But what I'm saying is that we are sold these dreams, whatever they are, and we accept them. And oftentimes when we get there, we're still not happy and we don't know why. And so I think it takes a lot of questioning, like, why did I accept this? Why do I think that this is the way that it has to be? And so that's something I try to do now a lot. I observe, you know, I've gotten a lot better at it. It is a skill. I think it takes a lot of me really being a lot more reflective of thinking like, this is making me unhappy. And 
do I have to accept that it has to be this way? And if it doesn't, how can I change that? And it is a slow change, but at least I become conscious of it as opposed to like, well, this is the way it is and I just have to suck it up and go along with it. So I hope that helps. And I think that this ties into this episode particularly well, and I wanted to raise it because as you will see, uh, Kim Lee Pham hasn't had the typical career. And what I love about her story, if you're a longtime listener of the show, you know that I typically have people that have quit a career and jumped to another career. But oftentimes it's like, you know, they fumble around with a couple of things and then they end up on that second career and that's what they end up doing. And what I love about her story is that she has like pivoted a number of times and each thing has been super successful and yet she continues to pivot. And I think that she just does such a beautiful job of showing that like you don't have to be in a box. Like you are constantly allowed to reinvent yourself and push yourself and push your limitations. And even if you are quote unquote successful at something, it doesn't mean that you are stuck in that for the rest of your life. Like you're allowed to um explore all of the facets of your personality and what you enjoy. And I think her story is just incredible. So Kim Lee is the founder and CEO of Morning Lavender Boutique and Cafe. She was previously a CPA at a big firm. We will talk about how she was doing wonderfully in that career and rising up the ranks. And yet she felt called to jump to wedding photography. And she did that and became very successful as a wedding photographer for almost 10 years. She traveled the world. She shot incredible weddings. She actually met her husband, who was also a wedding photographer through that career. And through seeing the needs of her clients, she decided that she wanted to start an online clothing store that's called Morning Lavender. She started an online clothing store and that took off and that led her to wanting to start a brick and mortar store. And I think if you know anything about, you know, brick and mortar retail, it's very different than starting an online shop. And I, what I love about her story is that, you know, she didn't have any experience in retail or brick and mortar businesses and she didn't let that stop her. She opened up a store that became very successful which led to her opening up her second store. But even then, she didn't just stop at opening up a second store. She decided she wanted to add a cafe. And, you know, opening up a food and beverage brick and mortar is obviously very different than retail. And I just like that she continues to push herself. This Morning Lavender Boutique and Cafe has also become wildly successful, and she is just looking to expand from here. I think she has so much wisdom in how to approach uh, giving yourself space to try new things. So without further ado, let's jump in and talk to Kim Lee. Hi, Kim Lee. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm excited. I am so excited and love all of the different steps that you've taken so far in your career. And I'm sure there's going to be a ton more, but we typically start back at the beginning. And I know that you started your career as an accountant. So can you tell us a little bit about like when you were an accountant, at what point did you start feeling like you wanted to do something else? Like, did you love it at any point or was it like from the beginning you were kind of like, you know, this isn't going to be for me for the long term? How was that career for you? Yeah, so I was actually a business economics major in college with an accounting minor. I got recruited while I was still in my senior year in college to join a big accounting firm and it just kind of felt like the next natural step after school. So I was an accountant for seven years. I became a senior manager at a big four accounting firm. And I enjoyed it at first just because it was something new. I really enjoyed the team I worked with. But I've always had a really strong creative side. You know, after a few years, I kind of missed exploring my creativity. So I picked up wedding photography. I started playing around with the camera, taking a lot of just travel photos. And somehow I, I found weddings, I guess. <laughs> so I was doing both for a little bit and it got kind of burnt out and I took a leap of faith and that led me into a full-blown creative career. And so when you were picking up the camera in the beginning and let's say you were doing travel and then you started kind of doing weddings were you doing it with the eye of like, I'm looking for a way to pivot or another career? Or was it just a hobby? It was actually just a hobby. It was just for fun. It was my sister's friend. They hired me to shoot their wedding 
rehearsal. It wasn't even their wedding. They were just like, oh, I saw some pictures you took for your sister. I really love them. You know, I'll pay you. And I was like, what? Like, (laughs) I wasn't even expecting to get paid. And then I realized it became more than just taking beautiful photos. It was, you know, developing connections with people that I really enjoyed. Connections with my couples, getting to know them and being part of such an important part of their lives. And then I kind of go back to doing my regular work and it just didn't feel as fulfilling anymore. How long had you been shooting weddings before you decided to take that leap of faith and kind of go full time into that? I did both for about two years. Oh, wow. So if you ever worked for a big four company, you're working 10, 12 hour days. So I'd work, you know, my regular nine to nine, I would say, wow. come home, eat dinner, and then edit for like hours or doing just, you know, learning on the computer about how to take better photos and just kind of researching location spots and trying to figure out how to start a blog so I can do marketing. But I've always been a person that loves creating and and starting something new. So I was definitely very excited about it. So I didn't mind putting the extra work on my free time. That's incredible. And I think that that's what a lot of people struggle with. You know, I think a lot of people that are really unhappy in their careers are already so exhausted and stressed and tired from these demanding jobs. And I hear a lot of times, like, well, like, I just can't take anything on. And I think that if you have a natural outlet that you have a passion for, that kind of does tend to supply more energy to you in in order to do things on the off time because it can be tough. But it is just such an incredible time with the internet because you can build things at night and in the early mornings and, you know, on the side. And so there's just so much more opportunity to start a business without actually having to take the financial risk of like quitting your job before getting started. Right. And I didn't have to go take a class. I could learn everything on my own at my own pace as well. Now with just a lot of like blogs and support groups out there, like it was easier to kind of network and find other people that were kind of in the same stage of their photography career as I was and, you know, learn from them. So there's just so many resources out there for you to actually start a business or just hone your your craft. Yeah. And I love what you just said that it let you learn at your own pace because so often we're and it could be just because we're so unhappy in whatever our current day job is like we just want to find something and make it happen very quickly. And a lot of times people abandon things cuz it's not happening quick enough or it's you know it, it's just going to take too long and it's like that time is going to pass anyways. And so I love that you did it for 2 years, you did it on the side, you did it at your own pace until you were at a place where you we're comfortable enough to make the full leap. Right. I mean, it's never going to be perfect. Once you start, you're not going to know everything there is to know. And no one's going to kind of lay it out for you. I feel even though there's a ton of resources, not everyone's path is the same. So I think part of it is just kind of figuring out what really drives you and motivates you. Also, you know, kind of getting your finances in order, figuring out, the practical part of it, it's not just, oh, I'm just going to take pretty pictures the rest of my life, but how am I going to support myself? What kind of budget do I need? You know, how much should I invest in good equipment? So there was just so many unknowns at the same time, but I was kind of at a place where I didn't have a family yet. I, I wasn't even, I don't think I was in a serious relationship. So I had a I was, I took a selfish moment, I call it for myself and really decided to, you know, focus on myself. And with my degree, I felt like I could always go back to accounting. Yeah, that's a great point. I kind of want to touch on that a little bit because regardless of, you know, kind of the rational mind of like, okay, you can always get a job as an accountant. For so many people, when you've spent so many years climbing the corporate ladder and getting a senior position and, you know, presumably making a good, like, safe, stable living, no matter how much there is this, like, desire to want to leave, there's that fear that holds so many people back. So when you were finally making this decision to take the leap, I mean, did you have any friends and family that were like, you know, this is crazy, you have this great job as an accountant, like, you shouldn't become a photographer? Did you ever feel like you know, maybe this will ruin my career. I'm going to kind of step off this treadmill. And like, what if I can't get back? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I come from an Asian immigrant family. So my mom was like, what are you doing? You have benefits, (laughs) you know, you're living 
the American dream right now. You're working at a great corporate job. And, you know, I told her, well, I can always go back. You know, I built myself a good foundation. And even though I might not get that job when I go back, I knew that I had developed enough skills and experience for my resume that if I were to look for another job later. And I just knew that in the long run, I wouldn't be happy staying at my current position. And at some point, I wasn't giving it my all. I didn't feel like that was fair to my bosses there that felt fair to my clients at my company. And then also I couldn't give 100% to my photography clients. So at some point I was spreading myself way too thin in both areas. And I just felt like I had to make a decision and I wanted to give one my all. And it was something new and something I had said, you know, hey, why not? Like, I feel like at a good point to try. Yeah. So you make the jump and Tell us a little bit about your photography career. Like how long did you work as a wedding photographer and what did it look like? So I was a wedding photographer for 10 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I've had a very long, you know, stints at different careers. (laughs) You know, I went from photographing just really small weddings to, after all, I got booked for international weddings. So I was traveling the world. I met my husband on an international wedding. I was kind of charging on the higher end towards the end of my career. I was doing 30 plus weddings a year. So I kind of got pretty popular, um, I think, just based on my style. And I think got into the business at the right time. It's when blogs started getting really popular. Wedding photography all of a sudden became kind of cool to do. I kind of segued into also a portrait studio. So I started photographing Female portraits, I focus a lot on boudoir photography, so making women feel really beautiful about themselves. So I was able to kind of expand my business. I also had an assistant photographer at one time, Mm. actually doing associate weddings for me. So my wedding business grew pretty quickly, and I would say pretty well. And it was a lot of fun because I got to travel to do work. You know, I was doing some of larger weddings where there was a lot of detail, a lot of, it was always kind of like a new location, new venue. So it was really exciting and fun. That's amazing. Clearly that paid off that leap. And so at some point you end up opening up a retail store, like clothing store. So tell us how that transition happened. Like what led you kind of now into fashion and retail? Yeah. So probably I would say eight years into wedding photography, I got married. So my husband, who at the time was also a wedding photographer, we got married and it was so much fun. Like I loved being engaged. I love wedding planning. I love the whole process. So when it was over, I was actually really like sad and bored. (laughs) So I decided, okay, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to start a fashion blog. I don't know. I have nothing else. (laughs) I mean, I, I was kind of a little bored of wedding photography. I want to be honest. Um, I love creating. So I wanted to start something new. So he's like, okay, whatever, you know, just do your thing. And so I was like, it was kind of an excuse to shop more as well. (laughs) Um, So I started this fashion blog and a lot of it was about, you know, my wedding stuff. So like where I found my wedding dress, you know, what I wore for like my engagement shoot. And then I started getting a lot of comments. Like people are like, oh, I, you know, I really follow your blog. I loved you know, where you got this and that. And I was like, oh, like people actually are reading this. I'm just not putting it out in the world. And it's just sitting there. It kind of fueled my fire to like, keep doing it. So I I would just style outfits. A lot of them were tailored to what I would wear if I were being photographed for different occasions. And so once that took off, I kind of saw a void for online shopping that featured really beautiful clothing that was also affordable. So I call it kind of photogenic clothing because a lot of my brides would come for engagement shoots and they would spend hundreds of dollars on a dress that they just wear for photos once. And I just thought it was ridiculous. And there was only like a couple sites that they were shopping from. So I thought, hey, like, why don't I figure out where I can source some clothing that I think would just look amazing in photographs, you know, put maybe a collection of 20 pieces together, slap it on a website and just offer that for my clients. Well, I kind of just don't do anything. Just (laughs) 20 pieces became like 100 items. And next thing you know, I was working on a full-blown website. 
involving my husband to help me do all the technical side and actually launching not just really dressy pieces, but also some everyday clothing as well. And within a few months, that also took off. Now that's pretty much all I do. I no longer do the wedding photography. I blog sparingly, but really my focus has become Morning Lavender, my my clothing retail. It's just so incredible. I think there's a couple of things that I'd love to highlight, like what you just said before, you, you know, going into more being lavender, like the honesty about the fact that you had gotten bored with wedding photography. I love that you're honest about that because I think that that is a natural thing for everybody. You evolve, you change, you grow. And after you've been doing something for so long, it's, you know, so many of us feel bored. And yet, We feel guilty, especially if something is successful. If you have left already one career and you're doing something that has become a hit and you're making a good living and you're doing really exciting things, we get stuck in this, like, I should just be grateful, you know, like this worked out. I should just, and so I love that you gave yourself the freedom to be like, well, I'm bored and I want to flex my creative muscles in another way. So I'm just going to try this blog. And so much of this stuff is just giving yourself the space to try things. Right. And I probably got more feedback when I left wedding photography than I did when I left accounting. A lot of people are like, well, you're making so much money and you're barely working. Well, they thought I was barely (laughs) working. And they're like, you get to travel, you get to, you know, do all these things. Like, why would you leave? Why would you stop marketing yourself? And I said, you know, I'm actually tired. Like, you know, wedding photography became physically tiring. Like weddings are no longer just a couple hours. They're like eight to 10 hour long days. And then you have a whole editing process that happens after it. And don't get me wrong, I was super grateful. And a lot of my relationship with my husband, our first few years, we were traveling the world, just taking photographs for people. It was it was amazing that we got to do that together. But after a while, again, I, I felt like I wasn't giving 100% to my clients. And I felt like I I also had to start making a decision. It's hard to spread yourself very thin. And I felt like if I wanted to grow Morning Lavender, I knew I also had to take a step back. And so you were saying that you you started this with the idea of putting like 20 pieces for your clients. But like when you were saying you were sourcing this stuff, like how did you even know how to do that? Like finding pieces from where and where were you like, were you ordering them and stocking them yourself and like shipping them out as soon as people were, you, you know, like how did you figure out this entire process? Yeah. So I had some friends who were involved in the retail business. And so I kind of learned, I would say the process. I, I didn't find the sources from them, but I understood the process a bit better. And from there, the first thing I did was I attended a trade show that I just kind of immersed myself and just kind of like observed and just kind of figure out, okay, like, what direction I wanted to take. I mean, I never worked till jobs. So (laughs) I had no idea what I was doing and much less an online operation. (laughs) So I was planning, okay, you know, I'm probably going to sell like, you know, one item a day or something, you know? And so I was like, okay, I actually had a photography studio where I would do all my photographs. I had an office in there. So I plan on storing the inventory there and just shipping out. I wasn't planning on quitting my photography job at that point. So I was thinking, okay, I'm going to just do my regular editing, all that stuff. And at the end of the day, just ship out my one order, you know? Well, the first day, I think I got over like 50 orders. My goodness. You know, I was planning on like, I remember the first order came in and I took that item, packaged it, and I got in my car to go to the post office on my way home. And then all of a sudden, more orders came in. So I kept on having to turn back to the office. <laughs> and at the end of the first day, I looked at my husband and I was like, you know, I have to ship from home. Right. So a week later, he built me a shipping station in our oh. garage. It's the sweetest <laughs> thing. And he came home and he surprised me. Aww. And um, what a great husband. <laughs> yeah. And in the beginning, I was like, oh, you know, I had this whole plan about like, how I was going to ship items. And the first item didn't even fit in the package that I bought it. Okay. <laughs> to ship it. You know, I just, yeah. It was a lot of learning, a lot of growing pains. But after a while, you know, I, it kind of fueled me to kind of, okay, like, what am I doing? Like, how should I be doing this? And just kind of learning more and figuring out even, yeah. you know. And I love that, like, every step that you've taken is kind of uh, led to the next thing and also built on each other. Like, the fact that you did wedding photography, you obviously, like, have 
wonderful photography skills and it was, you know, having those clients that you saw the need for these dresses, you know, for other shoots. And so that leads you to having this idea. And then it also, you have the skills to photograph it and put it online and you'd been blogging. And so I think, again, like people look at it like somebody that's 10 steps ahead of them and it's like, oh, I can never do that. But it's like people don't get there by just waking up one day and being like, oh, I'm going to start a retail shop and I'm going to, you know, have a beautifully curated blog. And it's like you just – you have to do things one at a time and take step after step. And it's amazing how things kind of build on top of each other. Right. So I I think how I got successful early on with Morning Lavender is because, like you said, I I was able to take beautiful photographs. I understood – also about blogging because I had a wedding photography blog. I also understood what looked, you know, flattering on women because I photographed so many of them. And then on the business side for my accounting degree, I, I understood forecasting and budgeting and, you know, doing spreadsheets. So that helped me a lot because I was able to manage creatively, but also on the business side. So I think that was really important and that kept me really disciplined in both my wedding career and now Morning Lavender as well. You started this online, but then you end up opening up like an actual brick and mortar retail shop. How does that happen? Because I know that there, I don't know much about brick and mortar, but I know that there is a ton of capital that's needed and investment and a lot more goes into it. There's a lot of overhead. You need employees. You need a ton of inventory. And so I think a lot of people tend to just stay online and just have an online shop because it, I mean, quote unquote, easier. I don't know if it's easier or harder, but it's just there's a, a lot more that goes into a brick and mortar shop. So when did you get to the place where you decide I want to open up a store and figure out that whole business? Having a brick and mortar is definitely like a whole nother beast. Like it's definitely a lot more costly. There's a lot more overhead involved. And I think for me, after a few years into Morning Lavender, I, I thought, okay, it became kind of like wedding photography. It felt like, okay, everyone was becoming a wedding photographer and everyone was starting to open an on- online shop. So because it was, it's so accessible these days, right? There's a lot of guidance out there how to do it. Amazon's kind of like paved the way to like help with shipping. I saw kind of like, okay, I how do I stay ahead of the curve? And, you know, it's kind of a girl's dream to always have like this little shop in mm-hmm. the corner that you could go to, mm-hmm. right? We also did a lot of pop-up shops in uh, the beginning. Okay. And that was a great way for us to build our brand awareness. So we would dedicate like once every season to finding a location around Southern California and just bring our inventory, partnering up with local businesses and just having a place for people to come and try our clothing so they could feel more confident in buying it online. And after seeing the success of it, you know, I thought, hey, even though like malls are suffering. I felt like there's still this desire that people want to come in and try on and touch the clothing. And so I saw an opportunity. We found actually our first store was actually in San Francisco. And you didn't live in San Francisco? No, I didn't live <laughs> in San Francisco. Oh. My husband has some family, he has three siblings that live up there. And I have some friends that live up there. And at this point, we had done two pop up shops up there. They were both highly successful. It was on this perfect retail street. It was the perfect location. And I just saw this opportunity and I just went for it. And my husband thought I was crazy, of course, <laughs> but he always thinks I'm crazy, but he's always willing to go along. <laughs> um, so for about three months, I lived in San Francisco while we were married and just ran the shop, looked for employees made sure everything was going smoothly. And we actually opened the store in a month, which was incredible. That is unbelievable. I mean, all of this is unbelievable. First of all, it seems like everything you touch turns to gold, which is just amazing. But I mean, I think that people see these opportunities, but there is just, you know, that fear that tends to be screaming in the back of our head, like, this is crazy, you know? And so I think that stops so many people. So what do you think it is about you that like, you just make clearly make these decisions and just move forward full force. And it seems like you're not inhibited. I don't know. Maybe you do feel that fear and just (laughs) have a wonderful way of ignoring it. But how? Yeah. I mean, there's part of me that's, you know, sometimes my husband's like, okay, maybe we should think this through first. (laughs) And I'm like, but no, I really want to do it, you know? And, but I think I just, I think I process things a lot faster in my head. So in my head, I've already, okay, 
how much is this going to cost? Like, right. what is this going to do? What is this going to take? And so I'm just like, I'm ready. You know, in like an hour, I'm like, I'm ready. <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. I'm scared of a lot of things. You know, I'm scared of like swimming, of like dot, <laughs> like random stuff. Um, but but I'm, for some reason, I'm scared when it comes to business decisions. Right. But I think because of my experience over the years, I kind of know what works for me. And it is scary. And, you know, don't get me wrong, we've made tons of mistakes along the way. You know, in this case, for example, the first store we only signed, it was a 15 month lease. So I felt like, okay, it was risky, but at the same time, we're only locked in for 15 months versus signing like a five or 10 year lease. So I'm not that erratic. (laughs) But I think I'm able to kind of look at it from like a bigger picture and take a step back and kind of figure out, okay, like, you know, where am I trying to go with the company? Like, what am I trying to do with it? And trying not to get too involved in like the small things that go wrong, because I can see that those little mistakes will just kind of help us in the long run and figure things out. Yeah, that's such a good perspective, though, to have. I think so often especially in entrepreneurship and business owners, they get so stuck in the details and like even like not being able to delegate, but kind of getting hung up on the little stuff. And I mean, obviously there's going to be tons of mistakes in any business. And I think if you can kind of have that bird's eye view and look at the what your grand vision is, I mean, it's just such an important skill to have. So you open this in San Francisco. And so what happens? Because I know you guys end up having another location now in Southern California. So What happened with the San Francisco location and how did you guys come to open up a second location? Yeah, so the San Francisco store is still open and it was so successful that I was like, okay, we need to open more. (laughs) (laughs) But at the same time, my husband and I were starting to try to have a family. So I knew that I couldn't just like move away again. And so I was like, okay, let's, let's open something closer to home. We also still travel a lot. And I've been to Europe and Asia. And I love this whole concept of having like a little cafe with a retail space. So I thought it was just kind of a cool environment. I thought it'd be really fun to have a space where, okay, women come and gather, they can hang out with their girlfriends, have a cup of coffee or tea and do a little shopping and just kind of hang out for the day. So I was really inspired by that idea. And then the other thing was just coming from weddings, I saw, okay, a lot of people always ask me, oh, where, where can I throw like my bridal shower? Like, where's, what's a cute little event space? And I was like, there's actually not a lot. You have to go to like a restaurant or rent like a hotel conference room, you know? Um, so I thought, okay, let's make this also a space where we can hold events. We can do like little workshops, you know, people can throw parties. I was like, let's build like a really cute patio And so, (laughs) you know, I had like this long list of ideas. And the funny thing is I found, I wouldn't say the perfect spot, but I found what I saw could be the perfect spot in my hometown where I grew up in Tustin. And it was this rundown building, like it had mold and needed a new roof. There was just, but I saw like the vision. I, you know, we actually converted, for example, four parking spaces into the patio. Oh, wow. So we kind of built it. The nice thing about it is because it was such a rundown space, it became like a blank space. So we could kind of make it into like this dream space that I envisioned in my head. It's just so incredible, honestly. I honestly am like, I remember like when I was following you and I was, I started, I learned about you more because of Morning Lavender. I'm in Orange County as well. And I saw the space and then I found your Instagram. And the more I learned about like everything you've done, I'm just like, this is insane. It's amazing. It's amazing to want to open up like you have something that's again, uber successful, you have a retail space. So you want to open up a second. And again, most people would just open up another retail space. But to say like, (laughs) now I'm going to add a cafe to it. I mean, that's a whole nother set of skills. You know, it's one thing to have a brick and mortar retail like clothing shop. It's another thing to have a kitchen and know how you know, have I'm sure there's licensing stuff for food and, uh, you know, and all of that stuff. So it's like you're taking on a whole new business by putting in a cafe. Right. And food (laughs) and beverage is actually very challenging as well. And yeah, my husband was like, I thought you I thought we were just gonna add like a coffee machine at the corner. (laughs) That's what he told me. He's like, you didn't tell me all this. And I was and at that point, he didn't even like coffee. And I was like, can you 
can you go and take some coffee classes and just... Oh my God, I love that. He needs to be a barista. And he was like, he's so amazing. He's like, okay. <laughs> and now he's like, he basically runs our cafe operation. I love this. I mean, I just love that approach. I love that you guys are just like open to continuously learning. Like most people just stop themselves because it's like, oh, I don't know how to do this. And it's like, of course, like nobody just know, like gets up knowing how to run a cafe, but you learn about it. And there's like so much information out there. And if you just have, and I just think your attitude is incredible in all this, but you decide to open this. And when you're saying this, like while again, like the attitude of seeing and seeing like, oh, this is perfect because it's run down. We can redo everything. But like, That takes skill, like knowing how to renovate and like seeing the vision of completely transforming a space. And then also, again, the capital of renovating an entire uh, space that size is is not, you know, chump change. And so I think, again, like people are kind of stopped with, I don't know what I'm doing, but clearly that doesn't stop you. So (laughs) that's that's just amazing. Yeah, I mean, at one point when we were signing the lease, we had to sign a 10-year lease for this location. Wow. And I was just like, that That was probably the scariest <laughs> moment. And yeah, opening, like when it comes to food and beverage, like the capital was definitely a lot more than it was just opening. Because for the clothing, it's just kind of a shell of a space. You just put in some racks. Right. It's not as costly of an investment. But once you start getting into plumbing, building a kitchen, electrical work, like all those things kind of started to add up. And there was at one point where I was kind of like, are we, you know, there was a lot of self-doubt right. during this process. But once when we opened and, and after a while when the bookings started coming for our weekend afternoon teas and I started seeing celebrations, I said, okay, this is, this has been all worth it. Like, this is exactly what I wanted to see here. Like in the beginning, we were working at the shop almost every day as well. And just having people come in and seeing how much they enjoyed the space and what we've done to it and like how they're going to bring their, their girlfriends back or their mom back. Like it just made us feel really good that we created the safe, welcoming space that we always wanted to do. Yeah. It's an incredible space. It's so cute. If you guys, everybody should go check it out on like, if you're in Orange County, you should actually go to it. But if you're not like even on Instagram, the handle for it's at morning lavender OC, right? Yes. It's just such a well done. I mean, obviously you're very, very good at branding and marketing and knowing how to create like memorable spaces and, you know, especially in this like Instagram world, kind of Instagrammable spaces. But again, one of the reasons I really wanted you on is because I think just this ability that you have to just trust yourself to figure it out and to take a chance and to try new things is is incredible. And I think to, you know, this is, I mean, I have lost track what like the fifth new <laughs> venture that you started. And again, I know you said it, obviously you had, there's been a ton of mistakes, but it's really impressive that like everything that you've started has been successful. It's just a very amazing feat, I think, for any entrepreneur. Thank you so much. And I mean, like, I just attribute a lot of it to just hustle. You know, last year when I was pregnant, I was like, okay, you know, I have to stop working after 9 p.m. (laughs) Like, you know, I I started to have to actually give myself like like lines. And so I think it's, you know, it's important to also practice a lot of self-care these days as well. But I would say in it just came with a lot of just hard work. Like we spent I spent all my free time, you know, working on my businesses. And so it hasn't definitely it hasn't come easy, but I think if you put the work and the research into it and you have the passion for it, I think you can do anything, I feel. Yeah, I know. I love that. And I think that you're just such a great example. I think even if people fail at something, it doesn't mean, you know, that they can't be an entrepreneur. And like, there's so many people that try and fail and try and fail and then knock it out of the park. But it also doesn't have to be like that. I just think it's such a great example of the fact that like, It could be so much better than you expect. I think a lot of times when we're in these jobs and we're miserable and we, you know, we're thinking like, oh, maybe I'll just try this one little thing. And so one of the point of the podcast is to show like how incredible these leaps of faith can turn out, you know, and I think looking at your career, it's just such a great example of like what wonderful things you can create when you bet on yourself. Right. And also, I mean, I don't know, from now just talking to you for this short amount of time, I feel like it seems obvious that this is probably not it either. I mean, are you constantly like thinking of new things that you want to try? 
Oh, I am. Like I'm <laughs> like I'll come out of the shower and I'll be like, hey, I was just thinking and my husband's like, wait, no. <laughs> we have a newborn, stop. <laughs> we've kind of slowed down a little bit or I've slowed down a little bit just because we have our, our new son with us. Congratulations. So, He's thank adorable. You. Thank you. So time is moving by fast. So we're trying to like take it all in, enjoy our time with him. But I just feel like because of the success of the cafe and, you know, the online shop now, I just, I want to keep going. I feel like the experience has been so great for the people that have come in that I want to share that experience with more people out there. Mm-hmm. So I definitely want to open more locations, what that will look like, what the time frame. I'm not sure, yeah. but I definitely have this constant desire to just create more and build upon it. I love that. That's so incredible. And how many employees do you guys have now? We have 50. So we started off, <laughs> we started off, I had one assistant when I first opened the shop and she was helping me ship orders and do everything in the beginning. And so in my garage, and so we grew from there to now 50 with all the locations. That is unbelievable. I mean, did you ever think that when you left as, you know, an accountant that you would one day be like responsible for, you know, (laughs) literally paying the salaries for 50 people. That's such an incredible accomplishment. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a job in itself to just kind of manage everyone, take care of, you know, payroll and just also, you know, just help manage their careers, you know? So it's been a crazy, crazy (laughs) ride. But I love that. And do you have any advice for somebody that was maybe where you were when you were at, you know, your senior manager position at the accounting firm, you were making a good salary, but you were just not fulfilled. But like, there are people that, you know, don't think that they have other skills or haven't learned anything else yet. And so they don't know what to do or where to go. Yeah. I mean, I think trying things out just kind of as a hobby or on the side because you kind of never know, like I never thought I would love photography. You know, I, I didn't even own a camera at that point. You know, my friend bought one and I was like, Oh, you know, let me just play around with it. You know? So I think just trying different things, trying to see what kind of sparks your interest. But also kind of being a little smart about it, doing a little bit more research about, okay, like, you know, what do I want out of this? What could this look like? Who do I want to appeal to? What would be my target demographic? You know, just kind of understand, hey, you know, is this something that I could segue into your career? And if that's something I want to do, or I just want to keep it as a hobby, because it's just an outlet for myself, you know, because I feel like you could keep your regular job. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with having the same career for 30 years. Right. You know, I, I think some people, that's what makes them happy that, or that's what provides them stability, which I think is so great. It's not for everyone. And I think that's okay too. I don't want people to feel pressured to like become an entrepreneur, to start a business, to work for themselves because it's not always easy. You know, Absolutely. sometimes I wish I could just turn it off at 5 p.m. <laughs> just not look at my emails or not, you know, make big decisions, not, you know, think of things and just clock in, clock out. I wish I could just do that. Right. No, absolutely. I think that's great advice. And I do think that just the fact that that we talked about earlier, the fact that you can do things on the side, you know, and even if it's not to leave your career, even if it's just for a hobby and the fact that there is so much available to us through the internet to like learn things and to try things and just giving ourselves that space and time, like maybe on nights or weekends to try something that we've never tried before is so important. And so many of our guests like let them to this like amazing career that they didn't even know they had a passion about. So I love that. So where can people find you if they want to follow along with all the amazing things that you do? Yeah. So my, my personal account is at Lace and Locks. So that's, that was the name of my blog that I started. And if you want to kind of see more on the business side, our main account is Shop Morning Lavender and our cafe account is at Morning Lavender OC. Wonderful. Well, I will link to all those in the show notes. Kimberly, thank you so much for joining me. This was amazing. Thank you. Oh my God. I can't get over how incredible Kimberly is. Here are my three takeaways from this discussion. 
one. No one's path is the same. So go at your own pace. Figure out what you need to learn. Take the time to learn it. And don't rush because someone else did it one way or another. Two, give yourself the permission and space to try new things. Just because one thing was successful doesn't mean that you have to stick to just that thing. I think her story is so powerful because even though everything she touches actually becomes successful, she continues to reinvent herself and to allow herself the space to go where her curiosities lead her. And three, you can just try some things on the side. It doesn't have to be a career move. It doesn't have to be with the eye of starting a side hustle. But start finding some time to let yourself explore new things so that you can find hobbies, so that you can find things that light you up, and maybe that will lead you to the passion or the next project. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, and I will see you on the next one. Thank you so much for listening. I can't tell you how much it means to me. If you liked the podcast, please rate and review us on iTunes. It'll help other people find the show. If you want to connect or reach out, follow along on Instagram and Facebook at Lessons from a Quitter and on Twitter at Quitter Podcast. I would love to hear from you guys, and I'll see you on the next episode.